This morning in North Carolina, wheels are spinning. Determination is winning. A passion is now a thriving business, and it shows no signs of slowing down. How? The power of a conversation, like the one Clint Spiegel had with First Horizon Bank about starting a bike wheel manufacturing facility in Asheville. Now it's not just talk, it's rubber meets road. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Recently, our client John met his banker to discuss plans for a clean energy building. What he found was a shared passion for building something more, momentum for change. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. Hello, once again, thank you for joining us. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. And coming up on episode 317 of Space Nuts, we're going to be looking at dark matter because there's a, there's a new theory that uh, could change the way we, uh, we consider it. And, and yeah, it might, uh, might change things significantly if it turns out to be true, but how do we know that? We're also going to look at Australia's newest supercomputer. Yes, it's Windows 3.1, maybe. <laughs> and uh, you might have heard about this story during the week. The James Webb Space Telescope image of a, um, a star turned out to be something other than. And uh, Sean the Sheep is going to join the Artemis One crew. Is that right? Or the project or something like that? Now, when it comes to this week's questions, something a bit different. Fred <laughs> has no idea what we're going to ask him. I've picked a few choice text questions that have been sort of sitting under the radar. So Fred is going to be uh, suitably surprised when it comes to question time later on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And here he is, the man himself, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. How are you doing, Andrew? Good to yeah, see you. Yeah, good to see you too in your high vis outfit. What the heck is going on there? Well, look, I'll give it away. I don't know whether you can see the insignia. Of uh, yes. Uh, that is the Sophia. Oh, aircraft. yeah. So this is a high-vis vest that's given to observers and crew on the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, which is called SOFIA, which you and I have covered many times, and sadly the news is that it's going to be yeah. wound back. So this is going to be a collector's item, and I have it courtesy of my colleague Stuart Ryder, who has observed on SOFIA a number of times. And... <laughs> he was with us for for brunch on Sunday this week, and he said, well, I've already got a high-vis Sophia vest, and they gave wow. me another one. So I thought you'd like yeah, it. So that's... there you go. I'm very honoured and proud and to have it. for those who aren't quite sure what we're talking about, Sophia is the observatory that sticks out the side of a jumbo 747 Boeing jet. It does. There yeah, it is. Which there. 747 SP with a hole that's in it. the back. And they're decommissioning it, sadly. <laughs> Mm, yes, it's mm. very sad as to what, what that happening. looks uh, it's rather swish. No, now that I see the logo. <laughs> That's not what you said before. Uh, no, I was just talking about the colours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take it off because I'm probably going to gonna have to stay, take some clothes off because I'm getting yeah, a bit warm in here. But yeah. let me take it off and back to All normal right. service. That's... There you are, back to the yeah. Icelandic jumper. <laughs> ah, dear. Yeah, we're, we're pretty close to Iceland, or at least it feels like it here at the moment. Mm. It does, yeah. This came from Reykjavik, and it's very warm. Now, the other thing we wanted to mention before we got into our topics today, you wanted a shout-out to Heidi in the US? I do, because Heidi somebody I met. She is a space medicine expert as well as a doctor. Met, actually, at a conference of anaesthetists where we were both presenting on space medicine. I was doing the space, and she was doing the medicine. I was an astronaut there as well. It was a fantastic meeting. Uh, but I haven't heard from Heidi for, what, three years, and was delighted to receive a text that said, Hi, Fred. Heidi de Bloch here. We met in Malaysia. I am a devotee of Space Nuts and was listening to today's episode. And lo and behold, my birthday was on <sighs> June the 29th. I was cheated. You made my day. So that's because it was the shortest day, 1.59 milliseconds shorter than any other. 
any other of the normal 29th of June. I'm just going to read a little bit more because it's nice, really nice to hear from Heidi. She says, you and Andrew enlivened my drive home from the hospital. I'm glad to hear that you both survived COVID and that Marnie and the cat are well. And then she goes on to say, one other thing for the podcast. You mentioned life being spread via planet to planet, etc. I was dying for you to mention one of my favorite words, which is orthopanspermia. It crossed it, yeah, I, yeah. Rocks, rocks carrying yes. life. <laughs> Should have done. You should have used mm. that. Yeah. So you met yeah. so you met at a, uh, a conference of anesthetists. Did everyone yes, sleep yes. through that one? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was it was a very very <laughs> quiet conference. Actually, it was quite funny because I met an anaesthetist there who had been my anaesthetist in a surgical procedure that I was involved with a few weeks before, and she seemed to be interested in my insides as well. Just winding this up, I like this bit very much. I love the podcast, and my Presbyterian minister husband is hooked too. It's so much fun to listen to, and as a listener, I can feel how lovely you and Andrew are and that you have a special friendship. Oh, you guys really shine. Thank you, Heidi. It's brilliant. Yes, it's so yeah, nice to hear nice. Heidi, especially to have you know somebody who yes, enjoys indeed, listening yes. to it. Especially on the now, way speaking home. of anaesthetists, yeah. and this is completely off off topic, but we were watching a movie the other day oh, called planet, Thirteen planet. Lives. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's the movie that Ron yeah, Howard really. made in the wake of those soccer players in Thailand that got trapped in the cave, and they used an Australian yeah. anaesthetist who was also a cave diver. To save them. Well, that's lives. right. Indeed. He, indeed. He was actually oh, wow. virtually at the conference I was at because he was presented with a, a, an award by the Australasian Society, New Zealand Society yeah. of Anaesthetists, I think it was. So, yeah, he was. Uh, well, well worth seeing that movie if you can. I think it was on Netflix, but yeah, well worth seeing that movie, 13 Lives. And, and I, it gives you, you know, there's a bit of Hollywood spin, but that's okay. But it gives you insight into how very difficult that rescue was and why an anaesthetist was required uh, because of the tight spaces and the amount of water and the time it was going to take to get them out. The odds of the boys and their coach panicking and drowning were very high. It's quite an extraordinary story. I found myself captivated. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'm sure it will be. Oh, it was, was an epic yeah. event, was that? It's one of the things well, that the, the whole movie's an epic too. It's about two and a half hours. But I was riveted. Absolutely mm. riveted. All right, let's get uh, stuck into it, Fred. And we're going to firstly talk about this this situation that's been put up in regard to dark matter halos. And you know, there's there's a, there's a standard model of cosmology that suggests that these halos are a certain way and in, in places. But uh, a new study through a, a few universities is starting to um, pour water on some of these ideas. Well, that's right. It's, it's, mo it's more that um, it raises questions that are um, really interesting and maybe not so easy to answer for the standard model. So yes, you're right. This is a multi-university piece of research. In fact, the Lead universities are the University of Bonn in Germany and my old alma mater, the University of St Andrews in Scotland. Scotland's oldest university, founded in 1413. <laughs> I was there. Shred cut the ribbon. Afterwards. So they've. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. They um, they have been observing dwarf galaxies in the Fornax cluster, which is a cluster of galaxies not very far from from our own local group of galaxies. can't remember the exact distance, but they're very, very well studied. And so, as you said at the beginning, the, the, the standard model says that galaxies are immersed in a halo of dark matter, which is what holds them together. So, is well known if if all that you could see in the galaxies uh, was all that there was namely the stars and gas and dust if that's all there is in the galaxies mm. they should have flown apart billions of years ago and the same with clusters they should have all drifted off and so it was during the 1970s that the idea was postulated that there was something called dark matter that actually idea was much older than that but it was at vera rubin's conjecture that galaxies are immersed each galaxy has its own halo of dark matter and that maybe the dark matter was the the sort of kernel the seed that actually attracted the hydrogen that eventually formed the stars and the galaxy 
So what has happened is that the dwarf galaxies within the Fornax cluster have been studied and they're in particular, the distortions of the dwarf galaxies. Now, we our most familiar dwarf galaxies are, are the two Magellanic clouds, which are in orbit around our Milky Way. They're being gobbled up by the Milky Way, or really, at the moment, strung out into long streams of stars, although the, the two galaxies are still recognisable as such. But that's what happens when you've got dwarf galaxies near big galaxies. They, they, they get distorted by this tidal persub- perturbation. But... What they've done is uh, they've actually looked in detail statistically at the distortion of these dwarf galaxies because according to the standard model that says that all galaxies are immersed in in a dark matter halo, the dark matter halo should kind of protect them from the distortion by the gravitational pull of other galaxies in the cluster. And they're, you know, that's something that you can analyze. So what the scientists did from these two universities were, and I'm going to read from our good old standby, phys.org, their article on this. The authors analysed the expected level of disturbance of the dwarfs, which depends on their internal properties and their distance to the gravitationally powerful cluster centre. Galaxies with large sizes but low stellar masses and galaxies close to the cluster centre are more easily disturbed or destroyed. So they compared the results with the observed level of disturbance. So they they analysed the expected level of disturbance and compared the results with the observed level. And actually, they used observations made the European Southern Observatory, actually at their site in Cerro Paranal. You know, Andrew, that's where the VLT is the four giant enclosures of the of yep. the very large telescope but did you also know that there was a vst a very small there? telescope and you, <laughs> well that's what you think wouldn't it it's not actually it's the vlt survey telescope <laughs> so that's what vst stands for so it's an acronym within an acronym but basically a wide angle telescope that looks for looks at you know detailed imagery and what they've what they've come up with and this is a quote from one of the authors The comparison showed that if one wants to explain the observations in the standard model, the Fornax dwarfs should already be destroyed by gravity from the cluster centre. Even when the tides it raises on a dwarf are 64 times weaker than the dwarf's own self-gravity. And not only does she say that that is counterintuitive, she says it also contradicts previous studies which found that the external force needed to disturb a dwarf galaxy is about the same as the dwarf's self-gravity. And so what it's saying is that in the standard model, it's not possible to explain this distribution, what you might call the observed morph- morphologies, morphology just being yeah. the shape of the of these objects. The observed morphologies of the Fornax dwarfs in a self-consistent way cannot be explained by the standard model. And you probably can guess where this is going next, Andrew, because we've got an old friend of sp- uh, Space Nuts who is studying this type of uh, fundamental physics, what we call MOND, the the modified Newtonian dynamics, uh, sometimes called Milgromian dynamics, because it was um, Dr. Milgram who actually, who, who, who suggested this back in the early 80s, in fact. So MOND is, is a way of saying that maybe our idea of of the way dynamics works in other words newtonian gravity and the forces that and the way accelerations are linked to forces that when you look at very low levels of gravity that breaks down and that's the the basis of the mon theory and so what they've done is they've repeated their analysis using the mon theory and they get really good agreement with what they see in fact Indranil Banik from the University of St. Andrews says, our results show a remarkable agreement between observations and the MOND expectations for the level of disturbance of the Fornax dwarfs. It's exciting to see that the data we obtained with the VLT survey telescope allowed such a thorough test of cosmological models. And that's from one of the other authors, Aku Benhola, from the University of Ulu in Finland. Um, they are they're among the other co-authors of this study. So it's really interesting stuff, very provocative in a way, 
you know, we we have a champion of Mond in our audience who waves mm. the flag for it. We occasionally talk to him, Peter Verweyen, and it's interesting to see something that actually supports Mond rather than dark matter. Whether the whole opinion, you know, p- opinion of the of the world of astronomy will will give up on the idea of subatomic particles being what constitutes dark matter or and 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 have another look at mond which has actually already been ruled out for other reasons but you never know something's going on here that's yeah. really interesting uh, well yeah so obviously the the evidence stacks up and they can back it up with the uh, with the data so it yeah it raises more questions i suppose that's what i'm trying to say yeah the trouble is, so you've got you know these in different bits of information, and this is one of them that are not that are contradictory because Mond doesn't work. I think it fails to predict uh, actually what you see in the early universe. You know, uh, there's no way that Mond can contribute towards what we call the cosmic web, the way that this scaffolding is was built up in the early universe for for hydrogen to fall into and form galaxies. So so I know Mond has its pitfalls, yeah. but so does dark matter. <laughs> so we're in a really interesting era. And you know it, it, fascinating that the way as cosmology in particular, the the study of the universe as a whole and its evolution, as that progresses, how ideas come and gradually shape the the view of all astronomers. Uh, You know, for example, in the 1970s, we all thought Mm. the universe was going to collapse on itself. And then suddenly along came Brian Schmidt and Saul Perlmutter and demonstrated that it's not. It's it's actually, its expansion is accelerating. Um, So Yeah, indeed. Who knows? Who knows um, where we'll be in a year's time? I suppose this will give them a baseline to work with and and move forward with other studies and concepts and and experiments to see if they can prove one way or the other what's happening. And who knows, we might get an answer to this puzzle one day, (laughs) hopefully. Yes, yes. Soon. (laughs) All right, let's uh, move on to this next exciting story because due to the fact that Windows 3.1 has become freeware. Australia now has a supercomputer, or is it a stupid computer? I'm not sure. But uh, let's put the jokes aside because there has been a development involving Australia's newest supercomputer. I didn't ever know we had one. Oh, yes, we do. Um, We have um, something uh, over in Western Australia uh, which is called the Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre, and it's based in Perth. And it's what is used to analyze data from the uh, basically the square kilometre array. And ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, the Murchison Widefield, um, Widefield Array, MWA, and eventually the Australian Square Kilometre Array itself. And the reason why this is in the news is that there is a new supercomputer which has just been installed at the Pawsey computing center it's got a nice name actually and i'm not sure whether i'm pronouncing this correctly Cetonix or Cetonix or Cetonix <laughs> and potato, it's named potato. after pardon potato potato, potato, potato. Yes, that's right oh, so it could be Cetonix <laughs> yeah Cetonix it's an it's a, a, a basically a zoological name andrew because it comes from something else that i'll mispronounce Cetonix brachiurus which is the Latin name for the quokka. Ah. Oh, yep. Nest Island. Yeah, that's right. Rock mm. Nest Island. They have quokkas there. They're, they're, they're the quokkas throughout WA, I, I don't know enough about. Not sure quokka. exactly, but, yeah, I know they're, they're very um, common on Rock Nest Island and they're a they? tourist attraction. Yes. Yeah, so they're marsupial rats, marsupial mice. Are they yeah. a bit like our um, antichinus or...? I don't know. I'm not an expert on quokkas. Me either. Quokai. Quokai, perhaps it should be. Anyway, that's the name of it. And it's, you know, it's following the, the footpaths of so much that happens in Australia where the name of something new gets called after one of our species, like the huntsman we were talking yes. about last week, the spider. Anyway, this has now been announced as being basically functional. I don't think it's finished yet. I think uh, Cetonix is... Uh, is uh, still a work in progress but it's 
it's on its way to being eventually 30 times more powerful than the supercomputers that they had at Pawsey before. Mm. And so it is actually a very spectacular piece of kit. It's part of something called the the ENCRIS, uh, which is basically a government-funded program, National Research Infrastructure Scheme, I think it was, the the S, can't remember. But that's that's a way of government funding going into things like these laboratories and uh you know and um computers and the reason why it's really spectacular and i hope our listeners might follow up on this on the web because if you check out set and Ixt on the, on the web it should take you as well as to a picture of a quokka to a very spectacular image of a supernova remnant which has been imaged by ascap the australian square kilometer array pathfinder and these data have been analysed by the Setonics and produced a, an image that is really uh, very suggestive of what a supernova remnant is, which is basically an explosion. So when a star goes supernova, it sends out shock waves which interact with the dusty material around it, and you get something like this picture, you know, a, definitely a, an image of a probably spherical cloud of energy, which is radio energy, of course, because this is a radio image, showing how the shock waves from the supernova have interacted with the interstellar medium around it. Really remarkable image. And Fred, it doesn't surprise me when when I heard you say there was government funding, of course, they would have to wait until Windows 3.1 became freeware so that we could afford it, (laughs) which is good. (laughs) Always good. There you go. Mm. Yes. But uh, yeah, fascinating image of that supernova remnant if people want to have a look at it you can check it out on the cosmos magazine website but i'm sure you'll be able to find it in many other places yeah. and uh yeah and, and check out what a quokka is too while you're at it q u o double k a i think is how you spell quokka yes it is yeah funky little yeah. creatures they are this is space nuts with andrew dunkley and professor fred watson this morning in north carolina Wheels are spinning. Determination is winning. A passion is now a thriving business, and it shows no signs of slowing down. How? The power of a conversation. Like the one Clint Spiegel had with First Horizon Bank about starting a bike wheel manufacturing facility in Asheville. Now it's not just talk, it's rubber meets road. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Zero G and I feel fine. Space nuts. Now, Fred, uh, this is a, a story that's sort of captured a lot of people's imaginations and caused a few smiles and probably a little bit of embarrassment in some quarters, involving a French scientist who uh, purportedly released a, a, a wonderful image of a star from the James Webb Space Telescope, but it wasn't a star. In fact, uh, he no longer feels like a star because he's been forced to apologise. What on earth has happened here? (laughs) So, indeed, uh, so this is a gentleman by the name of Etienne Klein, who is a director at the French Atomic Energy Commission, so a scientist of of a senior level. And he put a picture on Twitter, um, which he said, it's a photo I'm trying to translate from the French here. (laughs) Photo of Proxima du Centaure, uh, the star closest to the sun, situated at 4.2 light years from us. It is it was taken by the JWST, uh, a new world for <laughs> something. Oh, for, yes, something to do with day after day, jour après, après jour. I'm not sure what reading there, but anyway, it's fine. So it's a star. It looks like reddish star. And of course, Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf. It's pretty well what you might expect Proxima Centauri to look like. Yeah. Except when I looked at it, I said, that is not a star. And that's because it doesn't show any limb darkening. And I don't know whether you and I have ever talked about limb darkening, Andrew. You I can see it on it. Recall it. See it on images of the sun. The limb is just the edge. And oh, so okay. if you look at a picture of the sun, just taken in ordinary white light, ordinary visible light, you'll see it's darker towards the edge of the picture, and that's because you're looking through a thicker layer of, of atmosphere, essentially. 
on the sun. So that's a term known as limb darkening. It's well known to astronomers, and stars do it too. But this uh -huh. one doesn't because it is a picture of a slice of chorizo sausage, <laughs> Spanish <laughs> sausage. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know about the finer details when it comes to these kinds of images. So no. when I saw it and, and uh, read the headline, I saw the star before I realised what was going on. Yes. <laughs> and completely duped me. Personally, I think it's hilarious. I, yeah. I think it's I think it's funny. Right. And, you know, I love people who, uh, you know, enjoy having a bit of fun. It's not harmful fun. And, but he has been a force has been a for, force to apologize for his indiscretion. He does. He has to. That's right. I mean, you know, what I like is people who don't take themselves too seriously in science. You've got to be safe. There are times when you have to have the utmost seriousness, but there are times when you can perhaps afford not to be. Unfortunately, as you said, he got kind of, you know, a bit of criticism from, 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 tw from Twitter. I've just realised that the thing I was trying to translate from the French is actually written oh, in right. English above it, which says a new world is re revealed every day. <laughs> uh, so he got uh, basically criticised by the fact that scientists, we often have to, you know, we've often got to defend against fake news. We've often got to tell people yeah. this is not a real image. It's, it's you know, you, there's plenty of them around, and I get them from time to time as well. People ask me about them. And so he he's apologised. He said his aim was to remind people to be wary of arguments from people in positions of authority. I come to present my apologies to those who may have been shocked by my prank, which had nothing original about it, he, he tweeted. Maybe uh, it would have been more acceptable yes. had he done it on the first of April. Yes, that would have been would have been better. That's right. Yeah, he should have waited. Somebody tweeted, "Coming from a scientific research director, it's quite inappropriate to share uh, this type of thing." You can, I guess you can so, see but, that, uh, but you know, it, you know, uh, from yeah. my perspective as somebody who likes a great prank, I, 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 I thought it was fun. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it, <laughs> but. Uh, it reminds yes, me I of the, the BBC's great April Fool's Day joke of the spaghetti harvest of Switzerland, I think it was, and it was done on the BBC's Panorama program back in the 50s, and oh, right. it was so convincing yeah. because people didn't know much about overseas cuisine in those days. Uh, you stuck with your no. mangas and mash in the UK. <laughs> so when they found out they were being That's duped right. about all this um, spaghetti growing on trees and spaghetti harvest and the narrow window of opportunity to do. They were absolutely furious that Panorama would do something like that. So I can understand why you'd get a bit upset because, you know, from their perspective, Panorama was a serious news show. You didn't do that. So that's kind of what's happened here. I think that's right, yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We've come a long way but, since uh, Panorama in the 1950s, but maybe not quite far enough for this sort of thing. It still stands up as the greatest April Fool's jo yeah. Day joke in history. <laughs> and you can watch it on YouTube. Yes. So it's worth a look. But uh, this one, yeah, not bad at all. I'll, I'll give him a, a 7.5. There you go. It's got the Andrew Dunkley um, feel of approval. Yeah, I'd give him 10 out of 10 if he timed it better. Yeah. <laughs> First of April would have done it, that's right. Yeah, but it's a very convincing picture for those of us who don't know what to look for in the image of a star. <laughs> so well worth checking out. Uh, this is space. Oh, no, we've got one more thing. I'm no. Sorry. Let's move on to the next. So many topics. I wasn't uh, yeah, we usually got... do one per segment, but um, Just we've got one. another one. Sean the Sheaf is going to be a, a crash test dummy. Well, he, yes, he's he's not actually. He's he's <laughs> he's going with a crash test dummy, which also has a name. Actually, that's it's a mannequin, which is in a you know a seat on the Artemis mission. If you remember, the Artemis we hope will launch before the end of the month, which is mm. the uncrewed version of what we hope the next time we'll take astronauts around the moon. It's a, it's a translunar mission to send the spacecraft around the moon. In fact, it goes 70,000 kilometres beyond the moon. It's going to be quite a serious ex, ex, um, external extension of the excursion. There you go, three Xs in a row. But it does already have a sort of mannequin, mannequin on board, which, will, which has accelerometers attached to it and things of that sort, uh, you know, 
temperature measurements and all kinds of sensors, radiation sensors. The mannequin is actually named after a gentleman whose name was Arturo Campos, who was the electrical power subsystem manager for Apollo 13 on the lunar module. Oh, wow. So oh. he was the guy who brought the Apollo 13 astronauts back to Earth. Uh, at least he was a key player. So they've named him, yeah. they've named the mannequin. He's not a mannequin, he's Munikin. Munikin Campos is, is his name. That's the mannequin. But right. the mannequin has company. <laughs> and it's an ESA, European Space Agency addition to the mission because ESA is involved with uh, Artemis. And it's Sean the Sheep, famous Ardman cartoon character or um, what you call it animation character that's probably the best way to do yeah it's i don't know if you call it claymation or animation i think it's closer to an animation yes but i'm a big fan yeah yeah is it was it nick park was that the guy's name who started that stuff up i'm misremembering yeah i couldn't tell you (laughs) somebody would know um Uh, we can probably check that quickly probably (laughs) man i think it was uh, I think it was Nick Park who, who set all that up. Gosh, I've got very slow internet here. I wonder uh, why. Nick Park. Yes, Nick Park. Yeah, that's so I got it right. I thought it was Nick Park, yeah. Stop uh, motion animation is what they call it. That's what it is. Stop yep. motion animation, yeah. So Sean the Sheep, a very much-loved character, in uh, starred in s- several movies, I think. It's just apparently it's tradition uh, that you always take a doll of some sort. I mean, it's often been a dinosaur uh, even Yuri Gagarin took a doll with him for the first ever human space flight. Is that and, true? Uh, yeah, he did. It, the way you, the way you demonstrate, you're in, you know, zero gravity. Well, you, you're in oh, effectively yeah. weightless. And you're not in zero gravity, but you're weightless. You let the puppet or the doll float. So we might see images of Sean floating around in the Artemis capsule as he as he heads off to the moon and back. We hope because this yeah, mission we'll will definitely hope they come back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if they're going 70,000 kilometres past the moon with this test mission, does that suggest they're going to try the same thing with people on board? And would that then mean that those people will have travelled further from Earth than any other human, or is that a stretch? No, I think that is planned. It should Yes, I, I need to check that. But the certainly the, the uncrewed, it's Artemis 1. Yep, which, Artemis which I've 2, got my name on. As have uh, several. You do. That's right. Yes, you. you yeah, you've got your name there. Yep. So Sean might read it out or something. I've got a boarding pass. Um, and uh, Artemis Two. Let's just check the NASA details of that because we can do it. At least we can when the internet's working. Yeah. It will indeed. The astronauts on their first flight aboard NASA's Orion spacecraft will travel farther into the solar system than humanity has ever travelled before. And it's to confirm all the spacecraft systems and make sure that everything's going to go. So Artemis 2 will indeed build upon the uncrewed Artemis 1 flight by demonstrating a broad range of the space launch system and Orion capabilities needed on deep space missions. It's wow. quite ext- mm. exciting. Yeah, Artemis 2 goes around the moon and does a sort of figure of eight loop, a little bit like Apollo 8 did, yeah. if you remember what happened there. But the details are all on NASA's website. Of course. Absolutely wonderful. And we wish Sean the Sheep at all good luck. And we can't wait for that launch to happen and follow the, the mission, especially those of us who have got our names on board. That, I think, is really exciting. It's as close as I'll ever get to going to the moon, I think, Fred. You never know, Andrew. Don't give up. I haven't. You're just a young lad. <laughs> I'm waiting for my invitation. That's why I stay so fit. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Mm, okay. I'll leave it there, but there'll be more on that story going forward. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Want a holiday gift your employees or clients will actually love? Send them gourmet peanuts from Hubbard Peanut Company. Hubs Peanuts is a family-owned company that's been making high-quality, delicious peanuts and sending them to every corner of the globe since 1954. Order some of Hub's plain, salted, or chocolate-covered peanuts in a special gift tin for the perfect gift for your friends, employees, clients, or even yourself. Visit HubsPeanuts.com. That's H-U-B-S Peanuts.com. It's a holiday story. It's a family story. It's a story of thousands of twinkling lights and countless memories. A story of crackling fireplaces and candlelight Christmas evenings. 
where the sounds of sleigh bells and carols echo all around. It's a story of peace and togetherness, of glittering ornaments, fragrant wreaths, and wide-eyed wonder. It's the enchanting story of a beloved tradition at America's largest home, with 250 magnificently decorated rooms, each with its own stories to tell. But all this can't begin to tell the full story of Christmas at Biltmore. Come walk in the footsteps of the Vanderbilt family and immerse yourself in a winter wonderland of endless holiday delights. Because as wondrous as the story of Christmas at Biltmore may be, it can never be complete without you. Plan your visit at Biltmore.com. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, uh, it is question time, and normally you and I have sat down and pondered and thought and selected and discarded. No, we don't do that. <laughs> Questions from the audience. But today, you have no idea what I'm going to ask you. No, I don't. That's all right. No, I've, on got about, uh, I've got four questions from three listeners. They're all very short, and some of them just a bit out of left field, which I thought you would enjoy. <laughs> Okay. All right. This comes from Travis in Auckland, New Zealand. Why do astrono- Why do astronomers refer to all the chemical elements heavier than hydrogen and helium as metals? Metals, <laughs> because we're dumb, really. <laughs> it, it's true. So, the normal definition of a metal is something that conducts electricity, I think, or some definition like that. Whereas astronomers just have a different definition. It's anything heavier than hydrogen or helium is a metal. Uh, because it's not hydrogen or helium. These, so, these are the same it, people that photograph Chorizo and call it a star. <laughs> That's what it is. No, he wasn't an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to you, distancing yeah. yourself. <laughs> Just an uh, atomic scientist, you know. Yeah, it is weird. It's a quirky thing. We really should get, you know, we should get real about. <laughs> but and in fact, it's em- embodied in a in another word um, that we use. I think I'm going to sneeze, Andrew. Oh, no, it's gone. That's all right. <laughs> I did I had that happen on air the other day on the radio station. <laughs> Couldn't stop it. No, there are times when you can't. So we talk about the metallicity uh, of, of um, for, for example, of a star, because you can work out the ratio between the hydrogen in the star, and then you pick another of the elements, and it's usually iron, in fact, that's used for this. It's the ratio of iron to to hydrogen. And you can understand why that then is called a metal, because iron's a metal in both senses, whether you mean astronomical or physical. But yes, the metallicity is how much how much of heavier elements there are in the star's atmosphere. And of course, it's a link to the star's age as well, mm. because the the lower the level of of non uh, well, the lower the level of metals, i.e. not hydrogen or helium in the star's atmosphere, the older it is, the earlier in the in the universe it was formed. Okay. So they call it <laughs> a metal because? Because they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Travis. Next question comes from Scott in Lancashire. As we all know, for some reason, Uranus spins on its side in relation to the sun. Is it destined to, destined to stay like that till the end of the solar system, or will the sun's gravity or some other force gradually pull it back around? Thanks for the podcast, guys. You make Thursdays worth looking forward to. Gee, you're easily pleased. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, that's a really good question uh, because it does tend to be the, you know, the long, long-term effect of gravity is to try and straighten things up. Uh, to make orbits circular and to make things stand up in their orbits and behave. Mm. So I think it's possible, but I don't know what kind of time scale we would be we would be thinking about there in terms of how long that process might take. Well, and, I suppose we can analyse Uranus pretty effectively from where we are. Would we not notice if it was starting to straighten up? Not over the timescales that we've been observing the ah. solar system. You know, you'd be talking millions of years, if not hundreds of millions or billions. Mm. Yeah, that. Let me just. Oh, you've got him thinking now, Scott. <laughs> okay, so what I've put in to Google is Uranus long-term obliquity, because it's the obliquity of its orbit that is in question. Um, 
Even the don't great astronomer it. uses Dr. Google. <laughs> <laughs> Quite so. So it's spin orbit resonance. So here's a paper uh, which investigates whether Uranus's 98 degrees obliquity was a byproduct of a secular spin orbit resonance. In other words, could it have been something other than a collision? Look, I think that there are mechanisms that you can imagine that it would, in fact, um, make Uranus want to tilt back again. But I'm not sure what sort of uh, what sort of lengths of time mm. that we're talking about. A very, Indeed. very interesting question. And I will look at that again. I mean, I don't think there will be any change that we would notice yeah. for a very so it long could time. happen. It just would be a very longitudinal effect. A long, yes. long right. slow process. There you go, Scott. So, uh, yeah, you're kind of on the money. You're just going to have to wait mm. a little while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Tom from Stockport in the UK has two questions for us. One, just wondering if black holes and white holes are meant to exist and are supposed to be opposites to each other, what would you think a grey hole would do? They do exist. They're on the moon. They're called grey oh, it. Yeah, I love it, a grey hole. Um, yes, so, so we don't know whether white holes exist and... My guess is that they don't. They're just a, a quirk of the mathematics that says that they might be able to exist. Black holes definitely do exist. So, you know, they're just holes, very, very old black holes. Well, could be, could be, yes, yeah. Just like the grey nomads yep. who tour around Australia, they might be. That could be elderly it. black holes. But, um, yes, I mean, and if there's no black. white holes, then black holes stay black because they can't mix with the white and turn grey. They can't mix with them. I suspect if you got a black hole and a white hole I together, though, it, would it would be, be quite spectacular. Yeah, that would yes. be a yeah. sight to see. But um, <laughs> probably no such thing. Black only. It's it's like the um, a white Model T yeah, Ford. You can get it in any colour you like, as long as it's black. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, Tom's other question. This one is a little bit more serious, but still tongue in cheek. Some people believe the Earth is flat. So, mm -hmm. do they believe? That the universe is flat too. If so, would the universe still work in the same way or move in a completely different way or not work at all? Love the show, Tom. Well, the universe oh. is thought to be flat in, in the sense that it's not flat in like a tabletop. It's flat in that its geometry is not curved. In other words, the normal geometry that we experience around us where parallel parallel lines never meet and things of that sort, that is yep. what you get in a flat universe. A universe with curvature gets all kinds of other things in it as well, like these parallel lines crossing and things of that sort. So, so yeah, but look, the flat Earth really doesn't have any merit whatsoever. Flat universe does, but it's not mean that it's it's shaped like a tabletop in fact we think the universe is isotropic which means pretty well has spherical symmetry it's the same in all directions okay. so yes no point really yeah. entertaining this angle of thought i, I suppose but um and I, I don't see how a flat universe would work it just it would be yeah well what's the word i'm looking for the physics would make it impossible yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, the Milky Way is flat. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a spiral structure in a plane, and and you get that just because of the combination of gravity and rotation. That's what happens when you when you form a galaxy. Uh, the spiral structure comes from density waves moving through and and basically creating newborn stars. But yes, there's a flat geometry to to the Milky Way, and and in a in a way that's made obvious by the fact that we we look through the thickness of the the galaxy and see the disc the the milky mm. way itself going all around the sky there you have it all right tom thanks for your question great questions i just plucked them out of obscurity because they've been sort of yeah, sitting there a while and thought let's just do them all at once and have a bit of fun it's good yeah <laughs> yeah so thanks travis thanks Absolutely. scott thanks tom and uh, don't forget if you have questions for us and we could use a few we're running a bit low for some reason. <laughs> Maybe people don't want to ask us anything anymore, Fred. But uh, you can send them to us via our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io and click on the AMA tab to send us a text question or an email question or an audio question. And there's a little button on the right-hand side of the home page 
where you can send your audio question as well. And while you're there, have a bit of a look around, shop around. Astronomy Daily's there. There's the Space Nuts shop, which has all sorts of goodies available to you. Yeah, have a, have a bit of a squeeze. And uh, don't forget to check out the supporter page if you want to become a supporter of Space Nuts. There are plenty of ways to do that on our website as well. And please keep sending in your reviews via your favourite podcast distributor. We, uh, we love your reviews and they're very, very helpful. They just keep the audience growing. That is where we're going to call it quits, Fred. We got there in the end. Thank you so much. <laughs> We seem to have done. It's a pleasure, Andrew. And don't forget your lithopanspermia, courtesy of Heidi de Block. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. And a shout out to everybody out there who likes lithopanspermia like I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Fred. We'll catch you next time. Sounds great. See you soon, Andrew. See you, Fred. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts. And uh, Fred has sent Hugh yet another wonderful editing challenge on this week's episode. <laughs> And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company, and we'll look forward to uh, joining you again on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. And thanks to everybody who watched us live. We had another fun session. So uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you again soon. Bye-bye.